for Creamer Media's Polity, I'm Lungile Ngonfe. Joining me is author Steve DeWitt, here to discuss his book, Bush Brothers, Life and Death Across the Border. Can you give us a background into your upbringing and what informed your decision to join the army? Yes, I was brought up in Cape Town, raised here, went to an English school and matriculated in 1980. So that was uh, some 14 years before the end of apartheid. And at that time, there was conscription uh, in South Africa for all the so-called white boys. And uh, the military authorities came into our classrooms when we were 16 to register us. There was no escaping the net. And at the age of 17, when I was in matric, um, I received my call-up papers for conscription, and I was told to which uh, army battalion I would be sent. And it turned out that I was going to the infantry, which uh, was the, the the largest mustering, which meant that uh, I would become a soldier and be sent off to this distant border war taking place in northern Namibia and southern Angola. Um, and be sent to, probably to go on foot patrols there, to go uh, perhaps into Angola to participate in, in the striking of the enemy bases. And so it was the South African Defence Force, the old South African Defence Force, uh, which was fighting against SWAPO. Uh, SWAPO was conducting their war of liberation in northern Namibia. And uh, that was the context of the times. Uh, we were all, all of us in, in our class in, in my matric year were called up. Um, there were perhaps one or two guys who had British passports and they evaded conscription by uh, leaving the country, returning to Britain. But uh, it put so many of us in such a dilemma. Um, the, the feeling that we had was one of reluctance. But this war had been going on a long time and we had seen our brothers go and our uncles and our fathers and our other schoolmates and our friends. And uh, the feeling at the time was uh, uh, the the only way out was to go overseas. South Africa was being ostracized at the time. We, we couldn't get work permits elsewhere. We were very young and uh, conscientious objection led to six years imprisonment. So you were faced with either that, those six years or doing your two years. So I think, uh, you know, you, you had a diverse approach from the guys. A lot of the people uh, felt, I'll just go, keep my head down, not volunteer for too much, try and work through it, and then, uh, you know, look forward to getting out and starting real life thereafter. And that was the context in, into which uh, I was sucked into military service and found myself participating in this war so far away. Southern Africa went through a tumultuous period during the 1980s. What effects did a polarizing environment in this region and elsewhere have on you? It was a tumultuous period, a, a very tumultuous period. You know, looking back, it's difficult now to imagine the prevailing climate 40 years ago, which is when I was conscripted, 42 years ago. Uh, I had had a strong liberal upbringing and education and was very aware through my childhood that, that uh, apartheid was wrong. And there was a, a strong sense of it's going to come to an end. Um, geopolitically, what was happening around us during my, my school years, we had Portugal withdrawing from their colonial territories in Angola and in Mozambique. And then on, on our borders, we had the liberation wars going on in Zimbabwe and, and in Namibia. So there was a, a general sense that, that this was the age where colonialism was dying or the remnants of colonialism, because in South Africa, you had, um, the last stand being being taken by the descendants of the European settlers from so long ago. And they were, you know, they were putting up a resistance to to giving up their control. They had implemented apartheid and, and uh, that was done, you know, before I was born. And then you had 
a different equivalent up in Rhodesia at the time, which would become Zimbabwe. So those were the circumstances. And, uh, you know, one can analyze them deeply. A, a, a lot of people took the view that we were fighting a proxy war because the Cold War was dominating the world at the time. You had the democratic order globally against the uh, communist or socialist order, which was led by the Soviet Union. And of course, many of the liberation movements were backed, were financed and, and received their weapons from the Eastern Bloc, from, from the Soviet Union, from East Germany. The guerrillas were sent over there to train and so on. And then... I think that that white South Africa saw itself in the role of defending Western values, even though um, countries like the UK and the USA could not give South Africa open support because they did not want to be seen to be supporting apartheid. So that was the context in which many people viewed this war. And, and they um, conscripts who went up and, and felt that they wanted to go and participate in the war fell back on the rationale that they were defending South Africa against the onset of communism. And that was a very powerful argument used by the apartheid government at the time because it, it justified the maintenance of white superiority in South Africa. And of course, it smothered the other argument, which was very powerful, namely that um, participating in this war on the side of South Africa was actually uh, being an apartheid soldier and, and upholding apartheid. So, uh, you know, these are the two common analyses of the war at the time. And those were the tumultuous and, and very difficult times that we found ourselves in. Can you briefly tell viewers about the training you received for the war and in what ways you believe this ultimately aided in your survival? You know, there, there was a wide opinion at the time during the war, particularly in the 1980s, and the war ended in 1990, that the military forces, particularly the army that South Africa was deploying at the time in this border war, uh, was the best fighting army in the world at the time. And it was one, uh, it was an opinion which the soldiers, uh, you know, reveled in. They, they enjoyed that opinion. What it meant effectively was that our training was, was very, very thorough. There were training bases across South Africa. I wound up going to one outside Grahamstown, the 6th South African Infantry, and they spent almost a year training us, um, taking us from from induction, where we were just civilian boys, uh, reducing us um, with with very strict authority and and often uh, quite a lot of verbal abuse, if not physical abuse, breaking us down, and then reshaping us and molding us into soldiers. And uh, being an infantryman, we were grouped into uh, platoons of about 25 men. Um, and we would in time be dispatched into the bush to go and search for insurgents from, from Swapo. And uh, an enormous emphasis was placed on basic skills like uh, weaponry, shooting range skills, you know, accuracy with firing, and then on working together as a team. The, the 25 boys. So we were split into three sections of seven or eight guys each. And in a in a combat situation with the enemy, those three sections would have to work together to counter this engagement with the enemy if you had walked into them in, in the bush or if you were attacking them in a known location. And, and there was a lot of military science that had gone into how you would work with three independent units of eight men each, trying to dominate the enemy, gain advantage in combat. Each one of the three groups would have a machine gun and it would be a case of repositioning the, mach the machine gun in a, in a superior position, perhaps behind a thicker tree um, somewhere where it had better cover. And then the other two sections might withdraw. One would be put on standby in case uh, we were being overrun. 
And the third section would be used for a flanking attack to come around the side and, and hit the enemy from the side. So the training was very good. I, I, I must say that. By the time it ended, we felt very well drilled. We felt confident that we could handle ourselves in just about any situation we found ourselves. Can you discuss the challenges associated with acclimatizing to the physical conditions of Namibia and Angola? Well, the challenges were great. I was a city boy. Many of us were uh, sort of streetwise, you know, urban kid from Cape Town. And suddenly we found ourselves in the bush up in, in northern Namibia. Very harsh climate for much of the year. Very hot, um, humid. Uh, the terrain was flat, underfoot was thick sand most of the time. Um, uh, the the vegetation was was at times very thick bush that we had to battle our way through, fight our way through. And for much of the year, the biggest problem was the shortage of water. So uh, the the life uh, uh, among the villagers in the province of Ovambu up on the northern border of, of Namibia, uh, life was sustained by the existence of boreholes and well points. And the way it worked out, once we got there, we realized that we really had to become familiar with those well points, with the sources of water. And uh, a lot of the planning around the routes we took in, in our searches for the enemy had to do with making sure we were staying more on less track um, to being to the nearest borehole. And they could be sometimes seven, six or seven or 10 kilometers apart. And frequently you would get to a well point or a borehole and you would find it was empty. So that that was really the biggest challenge. Um, and, and then, of course, you had the rainy season, which arrived in late summer. And then the opposite happened. Then there was a deluge of, of rain. Now you had too much water. And we would, we would be spending our nights out sleeping in the bush. And often we, it would be in pouring rain. We'd have no cover um, with the plains flooding and the water inching up. And, and they were long and, and uncomfortable nights. What were your initial impressions of the border war? And do you think the actual experience of the war met with your expectations? My initial impression, and it was a view that never changed, was that essentially there were two wars going on, one in Namibia and the other one in Angola, and the wars were very different. The war in northern Namibia was low intensity. Uh, many uh, Swapo guerrillas had come across the border and they were now lying low, predominantly in the province of Avambu. And they, they deployed classic guerrilla tactics. They were, they were very well trained. And we had a, a, a lot of respect for our, for our enemy in Namibia. Their tactic was largely to, to avoid us during the day because daytime would be when we would patrol the most. You know, that was the safest time for us. We were fearful of, of patrolling at night. Our enemy knew the bush so much better than we did. You know, this was their home. And, and particularly, they were very good at tracking, whereas we weren't, you know, just despite having been given the rudimentaries in training, we weren't. So we would walk around hunting for them. And then when we slept in the bush at night, they would go out and they would go into the villages and they would go and conscientize, politicize uh, the villagers, and they would receive assistance from them, food, medical help, if, if it was required. But my impression was that it was a fairly sleepy war. There wasn't that much happening. And Swapo had taken the tactic of not confronting us as far as possible, but rather laying landmines on, on the main roads. And, and other smaller um, uh, devices, mines, you know, which you would step on and they would explode. Typically, a, a landmine for it to go off has to have a vehicle going over it. So, yeah, not much happening. Now, when you crossed into Angola, it was a completely different story. This was a country when I got there in 1982, which had been at war, I think, for, for 15 years or so. The southern Angola was devastated. There, there was firstly the war between the Portuguese 
and the liberation movements within Angola. After the Portuguese withdrew in, in 1974, there was now the, the war between Angolan rebels or, or guerrillas fighting against the communist government of, of Angola. And the, so that was a separate war to ours. You know, we found ourselves conducting our own war in a country where there already was a war going on. So consequently, the war was a lot more intense. It was more conventional in the sense that there were enemy bases where our enemy, Swapo, uh, was being trained. And, and so those could be targeted and hit. There was a lot more going on. The countryside was was destroyed. It was devoid of people. It was clear that the people had fled. There was a famine going on. It was a uh, the economy had been destroyed. The towns that we went through, which were not that big, but nevertheless, uh, you know, well established towns, all of them had had been through warfare. Um, the, the buildings were all bombed and uh, pockmarked, and they were abandoned. And all you would find were were maybe packs of feral dogs roaming around scavenging for whatever food they could find and you would hear them howling or or barking in the distance or around corners so it was a very very sad countryside and and the inhabitants of angola uh, suffered terribly under that war the book highlights the colorful characters that were involved in making your experience as a soldier worthwhile why was the camaraderie among the infantrymen so important to you well yeah, you know, Don Keely, I, I deliberately put a lot of humorous anecdotes and incidents into the book because this canon of, of border war literature, which is now 25 years old, has focused a lot on, on the more factual side of it. You know, histories have come out of, of army units and battalions and battles or memoirs have come out, which are quite dry in the sense that they, they just repeat sequence of events that someone went through. And I I looked at this genre of border war literature and I, I said to myself, what's lacking here is humor, is the humor of the day. Now, it's very difficult to find humor in a war. But the more I thought about it, you know, the more I remembered uh, the, the funny things that happened. And, and mostly it was the interactions between ourselves, you know, and the very memorable characters amongst us. I mean, we were a, a lot of guys up there, you know, thousands of us. And there were certain stereotypical characters. You know, you, you had your your really bad leaders who, who uh, were almost sadistic to a degree and, and made your life a misery. You had your really good leaders who were well-trained and, and who were respected. You had amongst the conscripts, you had your city boys who were apathetic, didn't really want to be there, ducked and dived, tried to get out of you know everything. But when the time for combat came, because they had been well-trained, they 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 buckled down, did, did what they had to do. And I, I broadly fell into that category. You had your, broadly speaking, your Afrikaans boys from the rural towns and the, the Platteland and the, and the farms, and they were more conservative and they felt uh, more uh, uh, positive about the war. They, they wanted to be there and they believed in their cause. And then there was a whole variety. You know, you, ha you had a category of, of boys who, who quite evidently were gay. And this was now in the early 1980s. You know, long long before the gay rights movement, and there was a remarkable degree of toleration for those guys. There was there was an acceptance that you know this is their disposition, and, and generally speaking, they were grouped in a bungalow or a tent together. So the, those boys had the time of their lives in the in the two years, you know. Um, so there were these stereotypes. You know, you had your Durban English speaking surfer who smoked weed all the time, and these are, are characters and stereotypes that. Uh, everyone who was there would recognize and I wanted to include them in order to make the book authentic and more readable and more fun, not to just be a depressing book about the war. The risk of death during the war cannot be overstated. With this in mind, in what ways did the possibility of death inform your perspectives on life during that time? I would say when we arrived, uh, the possibility of death was the furthest thing from our mind because we were young and brash 
And when you when you're 18, you don't think of of dying. You feel that that uh, you you know you're eternal. Also, because we knew that we were well trained, should combat situations come, we felt we could we could dominate them. And and we had seen our friends and our our brothers and so on who come back with with their stories and and we we you know we never really heard of a combat situation where our guys had not come out victorious you know we, we felt we could you know we could dominate and, and win so that led you to think or to minimize the possibility of death of your personal death so that was the the approach when we got there in time after you know Getting the lie of the land, seeing what was happening, and and uh, getting involved in in action here and there. That approach did change. I, I think the, the first thing that makes an impact on you is is when you see enemy who are wounded or killed, and uh, you know it becomes reality, and and uh, it's it's a it's a shock. You have known all along for your year of training that this was the eventuality you were probably going to come to namely uh, uh, violent scenarios where people had been killed, but to actually be there and see it, you know, was, was shocking. And of course, that then transferred uh, into your thoughts about your own mortality. You know, I, I could be one. And then as time went on, you you, you saw friends wounded and, and then people died and you became more and more aware of your mortality to the point where as as your participation in the war was was winding down, you now felt okay. I've managed to get this far, survived this far. I I haven't died. I need to just get through and, and get home safely now and keep my head down. You look back at the moments during the war with great fondness. What challenges have you encountered in transitioning back to ordinary civilian life? You know, I I, I perhaps would, with respect, dispute the first part of your statement that I look back at it with great fondness. I, I don't think that is what I would uh, describe it as. Um, it, it was a profound experience in my life, in all of our lives of us soldiers. Um, it, it happened. It, it's a part of us. We went to war, and when we left the war, the war never never left us in our heads. And and over the years and the, and the decades, your interpretations of the experience and what you went through and your memories change and uh, I think the mind naturally goes into a some sort of uh, numb mode where it tries to lock out the things that happened which you were not happy with or, or which affected you in a very negative way or the trauma and you tend to think of the happier fun times the times where you got up to mischief and and you know that kind of stuff now if I reflect on all that, I don't know if it's fondness. I, I don't look fondly on that. Um, I don't know what my reflection on it is. What, what I get down to is is memories of a small group of boys in very adverse circumstances, in a world that wasn't natural to them, out there having to survive, battling to survive, often very far from their their base, you know, your base was where, where there was safety um, and where there were there was a kitchen and there was food and there were ablution blocks and there were tents and beds and so on. We were out sleeping in the bush. The longest patrol we did was 28 days out in the bush, you know, with, with our food having run out long ago and uh, with, with no water and so on. The, the challenges were enormous. It was very, very difficult returning to civilian life from a war extremely difficult you felt that you didn't fit in you felt that people around you didn't understand what you had been through nobody wanted to talk about the experience to you there was no absolutely no counseling um, offered to you many of the of the men came back with ptsd which has remained untreated for their whole lives and the adjustment back into normal society was extremely difficult and frustrating and you must bear in mind I say the adjustment into normal society. We had to come back to South Africa and adjust to a society in which there was, which had its own insurrection going on. You know, by the time I got back, the minute I got back in 83, the UDF was formed, um, the United Democratic Front, 
which was a front organization for, for the various political parties waging their opposition to apartheid, um, primarily a, a front organization for the ANC. Of course, the ANC could not operate because it had been banned and its leaders were imprisoned. And, uh, you know, I got back to Cape Town, to which uh, was in flames in the townships, in the streets. Um, th there was a, a war, in a sense, of going on here as well. So it was hardly coming back to a normal society. And there was a lot of adjustment everywhere. It was, it was difficult. That was author Steve DeWitt discussing his book, Bush Brothers, Life and Death Across the Border.